Vsauce, Michael here. I'm just, I can't, I can't do his impression. Hey guys, Matt here. I just want to ask you a question. What do you think about when you hear the word tubes? Well, obviously not these tubes. I'm talking about these tubes. These tubes are used to amplify signals and they were once very popular and very abundant, but now are scarcely used because we have solid state technology. However, I don't even wanna talk about those kinds of tubes. I'm here to discuss with you guys the cathode ray tube. You may have heard the term before if someone was discussing a cathode ray tube TV or CRT TV for short. And basically these TVs are now outdated and obsolete just because they were replaced by LCDs. Now cathode ray tube TVs had of course this cathode ray tube in it to accelerate electrons at the phosphor screen and therefore create an image that we could see, right? Now after doing a bit of research on tubes, I was wondering for a long time if we can convert this cathode ray tube into a normal tube and amplify some signals and maybe even convert it into a diode because the simplest kinds of tubes, if you're unaware, is the diode and a triode. The diode, of course, acts as a rectifier and the triode uses a grid to amplify voltages and signals. So what I'm saying is that these tubes were the predecessors for our modern diodes and transistors. And actually, they're still fairly relevant today because they're used in guitar amplifiers and in communication electronics. And I think by far the biggest reason for me doing this in the first place is that I see these TVs thrown out all the time and I just want to reuse as much as possible from these TVs. I would love to see them recycled more. And of course these TVs were never meant for this application. We're going to be turning these cathode ray tubes, which were designed to accelerate electrons at a, at a screen into diodes and triodes and they were never meant for that. So, you know, you're not going to get good performance, but it could be a good educational tool. And, you know, you have free working tubes already. Like you don't have to make your own tubes or anything like that. If you want some experience with tubes, this would be a great place to start. Now I'm going to assume that you know a thing or two about how the tube operates, but I'm going to briefly go over uh, the principles of operation and then move on. And I know the goal here is to amplify and not rectify, uh, but I still want to talk about a diode here just because of simplicity. Oftentimes simplicity um, is the best course of action. If you get this to work, then you know the amplifier is not too far off. So in a regular tube like this, the plate and the cathode want to electrically connect with each other, but they can't do that unless there's an electron cloud present. And how do you produce this electron cloud? Well, you start off with the filament or the heater and the filament heats up via this 5.5 volts DC. Now, uh, this may vary from tube to tube because the filament is longer or shorter and or different, uh, but once you get the filament heated up to a glowing orange color, you can be sure that electrons are boiled off the filament and create this sort of cloud in the tube. Basically, the thermal energy that you're giving the filament gives enough velocity to the electrons that they break free of their orbits and create this cloud. And once you have this electron cloud, you can make electrical connections between the plate and the cathode. So here's how we rectify the AC. So we have 30 volts AC that's coming into the cathode of the tube, 
and we have to consider both the positive and negative cycles of the AC. So when the cathode is positive, then the electron cloud that's going to be present, it's going to stick to the cathode. And when the cathode is positive, as a result, the plate has to be negative. And so at the same time that the cathode is um, attracting those electrons uh, toward this side, the plate is repelling those electrons and what you get is no electrical current flow between the plate and the cathode. So it's effectively uh, cutting off that positive side of the wave. Now when the cathode turns negative, well then all the electrons over here are pushed away because like charges repel and as a consequence the plate is also positive since the cathode is negative so the plate actually attracts those electrons that are being repelled and you actually have an electrical connection on the negative cycle of this wave. And if you connect your oscilloscope over to the dummy load like this with the probe on the plate side and the ground of the probe on the other side, you will see a wave exactly like this. You will see that the negative portion of the wave is coming through, but the positive side is just being cut off. And of course, if you reverse these probes, then you will see the opposite of this wave. So now I'm going to turn on the filament and you should start to see an orange glow in the tube and that's the filament heating up and uh, releasing those electrons. Now by the way this is a colored television which means it has three of these filaments in there or three electron guns. Now with a black and white TV there's only usually one electron gun or filament and at least in this tube I found what they did is made all the cathode connections uh, or the connections to the case or body of where the filament is housed uh, they made all those connections separate from each other uh, so those three filaments have um, each separate cathode connections and what I did I just connected them all together um, I, I'm just using all these three filaments as basically one filament and I wanted to use all the cathodes as just one connection so, th so that's all I did. So I also want to show you precisely what I connected to in order for this to work as a diode because I didn't look at any diagrams. I didn't look at any schematics. I literally looked inside of the tube and I followed the traces or the wires back to the outside connections. So the first connection I connected over to the case of where the filament is housed or stored and uh, you can probably see that glowing filament too and the other side of the diode I connected to the very first plate in front of that glowing filament and that's literally all there is to it there's nothing more than that just make sure you have the right connections and you have a diode now this is also an interesting and useful trick that I picked up on so say you connected two wires over to the cathode and the anode, but say you didn't know which polarity it was. You, you didn't know which wire was the anode or which wire was the cathode. So these are my wires and I just simply took my multimeter, connected them up to the wires and I put my multimeter in its resistive setting. Now I'm going to turn on the filament and once that electron cloud starts to build up, you're going to see the resistance drop dramatically. And that's of course because there is an electrical connection now between uh, these two wires, between these two plates. Now of course I connected my multimeter up correctly to these two plates, but just like a diode, if I can do this in real time for you, just like a diode, if I switch or reverse the connection, nothing. There's nothing. And this is because obviously it's acting like a diode. It's blocking the reversal of current. Now I hooked it up the correct way again and I'm going to turn off the filament so the electron cloud is going to decrease and disappear. And we're going to see obviously that the resistance goes up. and eventually my multimeter will say overload because infinite resistance. Before I show you the chopped up waveform, I wanna show you what we're starting with. This is directly coming out of the transformer. And so we're looking at 40 volts uh, peak to peak on this AC wave. 
and we're at 20 volts per division right now on the oscilloscope. Now I put my oscilloscope probes directly across the dummy load resistor, the 15 kilo ohm resistor, and this is what we see. Obviously the positive portion of this waveform is completely chopped off um, and you only get the negative portion coming through. I also can reverse my oscilloscope probes on the resistor and when I reverse them obviously you see the opposite of that waveform. Alright, so now just for fun, let's turn off the filament and let's see what happens to the waveform. So I just turned off the filament. So the electron cloud should be collapsing or disappearing. And there you go. The waveform is just flattening out. So now I'm going to turn it back on. So I just turned it back on and the waveform grows. <laughs> Ain't that cute. Now you may be wondering how I turned that diode into a triode and all it is is just adding one more connection, one more plate into this uh, mixture. And so as you know with a diode we have our cathode which is the holder or the case where the filament is housed and then the anode or the plate for that diode was the very first uh, plate that was in front of the glowing filament. And all we need to do is add a third connection to make this a triode, um, but as a consequence our anode or plate that was previously in the diode becomes our grid now in the triode. And our actual plate in the triode um, would be the third connection and so that's actually the next closest plate to the grid. So in summary, um, the case where the filament is housed is still the cathode in the triode. The plate that was previously in the diode um, is the grid now in the triode and then the third connection is our actual plate in the triode and that's where you put in the high voltage. Um, and that third connection is just the closest connection you can possibly find to the grid. Now I could have shown you the external connections and how they look on the bench, but it's very messy and I think you would be better off with some general advice on the connections in the tube, because honestly, uh, this is going to vary from tube to tube. Like if you're dealing with a black and white TV, it's going to be a different configuration. And I think also with different manufacturers, the, the construction of the tube is going to be different too. So that's why I'm just talking very general here. All right, so this is the setup that I'm working with right now. And as you can tell, this is a preamplifier. Now, there is a big difference between the preamplifier and a power amplifier, but we'll get to the power amplifier in a bit. Uh, I just want to focus on this first. Now I'm just going to briefly go over the components in this diagram and uh, tell you what they can do or what their purpose is. So let's start up here uh, on the plate and let's start with the 76k ohm resistor. Now this resistor is usually 100k ohm and its primary purpose is to act as a load and convert the tube from a current amplifier into a voltage amplifier. Now, the coupling capacitor over here, its purpose is to basically block the high voltage uh, direct current that's coming in and to allow the signal, the amplified signal through. And to measure the signal, I have my oscilloscope connected to these points on the output. Now down here, the 556 uh, ohm resistor is the cathode resistor. Now, uh, the lower the resistance on this resistor, now the lower the resistance of this resistor, the higher your gain will be. And this bypass capacitor here, this 25 uh, microfarad capacitor, its purpose is to act as an electron reservoir and to basically boost the small signals that is coming from your signal source. Now you may be wondering why I have a speaker here that's connected over to the grid and reference to the cathode. This is our signal input. And the reason I'm using a speaker is because I just have so many speakers and uh, if the speaker does get fried or burnt out then I wouldn't mind replacing it. And honestly, a speaker is not half bad at providing a good voltage uh, source for our signal input. Now, everybody knows that speakers, when uh, voltage is applied to them, well, they can uh, produce music or sounds uh, with their membranes by vibrating or moving up and down. 
but the reverse or the vice versa can also happen where you move the cone, move the membrane of the speaker, and a voltage gets produced. And so here I'm actually using a speaker as a sort of microphone to produce some voltage and uh, amplifying that through the tube. Now this is the speaker that I'm using. It's an 8 ohm speaker and it has a very nice membrane. It has a, a nice surface area and this surface area uh, is you know nice to have if you're like talking into the speaker and trying to trying to amplify your voice and so it can act as sort of you know a decent microphone even though it was never designed for that another reason why I chose this speaker in particular is because it's so easy to move and because it doesn't take a lot of effort for this thing to move uh, it'll just be more easier for me to create signals with it. And actually, if you wanted to go further with this, you could start by cutting out pieces or parts of the membrane, and by cutting out a large chunk of that membrane, you could uh, reduce the amount of effort that it would take in order to move the membrane, and thus it would be even easier to create those signals, and, uh, and it would just act as a better microphone. Now before I connect this over to the amplifier, I want to connect this straight to the oscilloscope and show you guys the waveforms uh, directly from the speaker. And so that way you can uh, compare the uh, signals straight from the speaker uh, to the signals on the output of the amplifier. Alright, so the speaker is now connected directly to the oscilloscope and we're at one volt per division. Now I'm going to start tapping the speaker membrane and you'll see that it's actually pretty hard to get a signal bigger than uh, one volt out of the speaker. I can tap the speaker like really hard and I could get almost to like two volts, but it's just, it's ridiculous because um, I'm afraid I'm gonna break the speaker membrane at this point. Um, so let's just call that a, a one volt signal to start off with. So now I have the speaker connected to the amplifier and the output you're seeing has spikes because there is some distortion on the output. However, if I tap on the speaker now, look at that dramatic difference. We're still at one volt per division, by the way, and it's just going off the screen. Even very light tapping is being picked up. I can even talk into the speaker and my voice will be picked up on the oscilloscope. Isn't that crazy? A -U -A. So technically, I guess, I did it. I made an amplifier out of a picture tube, out of a cathode ray tube that was meant to display images and never designed for something like this. But even though I am successful in that, um, I am not done with this project because I want to drive a speaker. Now the signal that you just saw is actually way too weak. It, it just doesn't have enough current to drive a speaker. Now this is what I wanted to explain. Um, I said previously I would get to the power amp and this is that part. Now that first amplifier that we made is a preamplifier and the job or purpose of that preamplifier is to simply just create enough voltage to um, drive the grid of the power amp. The preamplifier was never meant to drive a speaker load directly. And the biggest difference between the preamplifier and the power amp is that the load on the preamplifier is actually this 100k ohm resistor. And the load on the power amp uh, doesn't have that resistor, it has a transformer that drives a speaker for the load. The preamplifier is just there to amplify the voltage, while the power amplifier is there to amplify the current in order to drive a load. Now this schematic actually comes from a real manufactured product. It's part of a bigger schematic that I saw online for um, this specific amp over here. But I just drew out these parts which were important for me at least personally just because I wanted to see how both the preamplifier and the power amp were configured to drive their respective loads. All right, so I think you get the point that I'm trying to get across, that we basically need to now build a power amplifier in order to drive a speaker. And so I'll come back to you when I do that. 
I finished the wiring in the tube, but I want to mention something very important. And that is if you want the maximum amplification in this tube, uh, you would want a lower resistance in the tube. Now, to get that lower resistance, you have to make sure that the plates that you are connecting to, so the cathode, um, the grid, and the plate, um, all are as close as they can possibly be to another, and also that the maximum surface area is being utilized in the tube for each of those plates. So, uh, for example, in this particular tube, or at least in these um, colored television tubes, I found because they have three electron guns, uh, usually the cathodes of those electron guns are separated. Now, I don't know why uh, the cathodes are separated for each electron gun. However, um, it is best if you connect all those cathodes together. Now, these wires that you see that are um, connecting uh, back to the tube itself, uh, that's exactly what I'm doing here. Uh, these are other wires that connect to those separate cathodes and I'm just connecting it all together to act as one cathode. Now what that effectively does, that gives you maximum surface area and it lowers the resistance in the tube. And that is very important for uh, the amplification in the tube. And just by the way, if anybody wants to know more about tubes, I highly, highly recommend this book. It just has all the information that you would ever possibly need about tubes, uh, different types of circuits, oscillators, uh, just everything related to tubes and things like that. Everything is discussed in this book. It's just, it's just been a huge help for me in this project and I honestly probably couldn't have understood everything uh, that I was doing if it wasn't for this book. Now I do get most of my information online, but uh, this book just has been the best freaking thing. And if you're curious, I'll just give you a quick preview of the contents in this book. And yeah. Now, out of curiosity, I wanted to measure the resistance between the plate and the cathode. This is also uh, otherwise known as the tube resistance or the plate resistance. It's the impedance of the tube. Now, why would we want to calculate this value? Well, it's actually pretty important if you want to know how much amplification you're going to get out of a tube. See, generally, the less tube resistance or impedance you have, the better your power amplifier is going to be, or the amplification factor is going to be better. But that also depends on the construction of the tube. Now, the value of the plate resistance will depend on the value of the grid and plate voltages applied to the tube. So this is basically what I did. I selected an operating voltage range and I kept all the grid biasing constant. So I already had the biasing connected when doing all the tests and I had no load across the tube. Now say for example you want to operate your specific tube between 250 and 300 volts DC. So you measure the milliamp current at these ranges. So 250 volts DC at 2.5 milliamps and 300 volts DC at 3.5 milliamps. And, and this is, these are the values that you measure from your tube when testing it. Then I took the differences of the voltage and current and divide to get the tube impedance or the plate resistance in ohms. And you can see I do that down here. And I divide the change in voltage by the amount of current in amps and then I get my approximate impedance. This impedance, of course, is for that specific uh, range of voltages that, well, you want to operate the tube at. Now, I did this for my power amplifier tube, and it's still a picture tube, so I wasn't expecting, you know, a great impedance, and of course, what we got in the end was not a very good impedance. Having a high impedance tube is generally not a good thing. Why is having a high tube impedance bad? Well, it makes it more difficult to match that impedance with the transformer impedance. And you want to match these impedances because when you match impedances from the transformer to the tube, then that gives the maximum power transfer. You're talking about efficiency here, basically. And funny enough, this transformer came out of a tube amplifier itself and any other transformer that I tried using just didn't work as well as this one. I think that just has to deal with the turn ratio of the transformer, but also 
It's surprisingly hard to find transformers like this. Because of course nowadays we're dealing with solid state electronics and we don't have to worry about um, matching a transformer to a tube. So you might have difficulty finding a transformer like this for a, a cathode ray tube that you want to use as an amplifier. Now another transformer that I found uh, that could be used and be comparable in performance to this one was actually, uh, surprisingly, a microwave oven transformer. So to calculate the impedance of that small transformer that I just showed you, uh, I put 60 volts AC through the primary and I recorded the voltage, which was 3 volts AC on the secondary. Now, um, dividing these values gave me the turn ratio, <clears throat> and squaring the turn ratio gave me the impedance ratio. Now, if you are using an 8 ohm speaker on the secondary side of the transformer, well, you multiply that 8 ohms by your uh, impedance ratio, which is 400 in this case, and then you get your total impedance that would be on the primary. And the impedance on the primary that we just calculated, well, you can see that this value, that value is not even close to the tube impedance. And therefore, we're wasting a lot of energy. We're not getting maximum power transfer. Now, because the circuit on my bench is messy, I just want to show you this circuit diagram I drew up. And this is actually how everything is connected on my bench. Now I know there may be some things wrong here in the schematic or maybe with the values I chose, but I'm not looking for anything perfect here. I just want some general amplification. I'm just playing around with this stuff. And I just wanted to see out of curiosity if this is even possible and it's turning out that it quite is possible. All right, so let me just show you it working. All right, so it's at 450 volts approximately right now. Um, the Speaker is on, the filaments are on, circuit is on, and of course you hear some buzzing, but I'm not really worried about distortion or buzzing at this point. I just want to see if this works, if there's amplification, if we get something out of this. So I'm going to start playing music from my phone and let's see what we get on here. All right, now listen closely to the music as I turn down the voltage. It gets so quiet. Now I'm measuring the AC voltage straight off the speaker and you can see it peaks over a hundred millivolts which actually is fairly weak but when we test the voltage coming straight off of the jack from the phone that we're using to input the signal well you can see it jumps up over 500 millivolts and so we're really not amplifying the signal. But it's not like I'm not happy because this actually works. Like the signal is at least getting through and it has enough amperage to drive a speaker. Now just for comparison's sake, I'm going to run this speaker, this 8 ohm speaker, directly from the jack of this phone. Now normally you should never do something like this because if you know anything about amplifiers, you know that this is risky, this is dangerous, this could actually break the amplifier in the phone. And that's because when you're trying to drive a speaker like this from the jack of a phone, well you're not matching the impedances correctly. And this is actually pretty important, you have to take impedance 
cadences into account and very seriously when you are working with amplifiers because generally an amplifier needs to have a high input impedance so it doesn't drop the signal when the signal is coming into the amplifier. If it drops the signal too much, well then you'll just amplify a lower voltage signal which is not what you want. You want the full signal going into the amplifier so thus a higher input impedance. Now on the output of the amplifier, so the output of the amplifier being this jack, usually it's a very low output impedance. And this is done to provide the maximum amount of current to whatever you want to drive. Now when you normally connect headphones up to the jack of your phone, well your headphones have an impedance of hundreds of ohms. And they do that specifically because they don't want to load your amplifier in your phone too much. They don't want that amplifier in your phone to draw too much current and destroy itself trying to drive a headphone. So basically a headphone with a higher impedance is less stressful for the amplifier to drive. And when you're dealing with an impedance of eight ohms for the speaker, well, dang, that is pushing it too close. This amplifier, this internal amplifier in the phone can draw so much current trying to drive this speaker that it can, like I said, destroy itself. Anyway, this multimeter is connected directly across the speaker and it's measuring the AC voltage signal. Now I hope you noticed that we didn't even reach 500 milliamps like I was showing before out of the jack of this phone. So the signal definitely dropped to a lower value and that signal only drops when it's trying to draw a lot of current driving a speaker that requires a lot of current. So what I'm basically trying to say here in short is that even though the tube amplifier is not the best and it doesn't really amplify the signal, it's way safer for the signal coming from the phone to go through that tube amplifier and to eventually drive the speaker itself uh, because driving a speaker straight from the jack of the phone itself uh, from the amplifier, the internal amplifier, is risky. Now, at one point, I did get a decent amplification factor. I was uh, using a different input signal. I was using a different phone for the input signal, and uh, the maximum AC signal coming from that phone was 100 milliamps. And at the output, I was getting maybe 300 or, or 400 milliamps or, or so, something like that. And so these tubes, if configured correctly, could give you a slight boost in amplification. Now, of course, I'm talking about driving a speaker, which requires, you know, a bunch of current. But when it comes specifically to voltage amplification, these tubes are great. When I was messing around with different values for voltage amplification, well, I got up to 40 volts from 100 millivolts. And that's just from one tube. That's purely voltage amplification, so you know, if you connected a speaker try, trying to drive a speaker uh, from that 40 volts of amplification, that, that signal will drop down from 40 volts all the way to zero. It, like you're, The speaker won't be able to be driven because the current is just not there. The, the volts, of course, are, but um, this is why it's important for you to have a preamplifier and then finally a power amplifier. Now for a while I thought that you only needed one tube to amplify a signal and to drive a speaker. But that's not the case. See, it depends. If you purely want to amplify a signal from say 100 millivolts to uh, up to 40 volts, well it's entirely possible with one tube because I did it and I can tell you it works, but the catch is that you can't drive a speaker with that because in order for you to drive a speaker, you need a power amplifier. And that's what this tube does on the right. That's the power amplifier. And the preamp is on the left over here. <clears throat> now I went over this before when showing you schematics, but the job of the power amplifier is to supply enough current to drive the speaker. And the job of the preamplifier 
is to supply enough voltage amplification to drive the grid of the power amplifier. And so that's actually a reason why power amplifiers are designed to take in a bunch of voltage on their grid and not cause any distortion. And to amplify a bunch of current, you also need a low impedance across the tube or a lower plate resistance or overall lower resistance in the tube. You get what I'm saying. Now I was pretty naive at first because I thought since I was dealing with tube amplifiers that the speaker on the output will be driven really hard uh, until it bursts into flames. But no, obviously that's not the case. You have to pick the components carefully and actually be aware of the internal resistances of the tube and, and the actual construction of the tube matters a lot. So this is a broken picture tube, but this is pretty much the exact same type of construction that I'm dealing with. And I just wanna show you, if you can see those three holes on this very thin plate, that is the grid, or that would be the grid if we're turning this tube into a triode to amplify a small signal. And normally triodes are not designed this way. They are not built this way. And because of those small holes uh, to act as a grid, well, this just basically means you're gonna get very poor amplification. You're not gonna get a high amplification factor out of this tube. Now, to get anywhere close to being able to drive a speaker as loud and as hard as I would want, I would probably need at least four of these tubes. I had great success with amplifying small 100 millivolt uh, signals into up to 40 volt signals, uh, but I just had more trouble with building a power amplifier out of these tubes uh, because the resistance, the, the impedance of these tubes was so high. But one thing I can absolutely recommend you use these tubes for is if you need a high powered diode. If you need a diode that can handle high voltage and large amounts of current, then this would be a perfect candidate. As far as voltage goes, I did put 800 volts DC between the plate and the cathode of one of these tubes, and it handled it just fine. And I'm sure it can handle over a thousand volts between the plate and the cathode, but most of the time it shouldn't even be necessary to go up to that high of a voltage. The only big downside to this is that you have to deal with this huge picture screen that you are not using. And so I don't have the proper equipment, but an idea that I have is maybe heating up the glass around this tube and just heating it up enough for it to become very soft. And you could just slowly stretch out the glass and pull this tube literally off of this body. So you might want to use like an oxyacetylene torch for something like that. I'm not sure exactly. And if you do manage to separate this tube from the body by uh, heating the surrounding glass, melting it and just like pulling it off and, and making sure that the vacuum stays in the tube, well, then you could have a collection of very crude but workable tubes. And that would be an amazing idea to recycle these TVs. So I'm just handing out free ideas over here. All right, so I hope you learned a thing or two about tubes in general and that actually making an amplifier or a diode out of these uh, old picture tubes, these cathode ray tube TVs, is very possible and actually quite fun to play around with. So if you never worked with tubes or always wondered how they work, well, this actually would be a great place to start and you won't have to worry about breaking anything because if you do, they're easily replaceable. Anyway, as always, I hope you learned something, and I'll catch you in the next one.